We see this as a public health crisis, and we intend to be a catalyst of change and to address this, and we think uh, that you are the right partners for that. Schools are ground zero of the epidemic, and if we want to move policy forward, we need to educate the public what's really going on. It's a more of incumbent upon us to find a solution to try because it's happening more in our schools hmm. than it is outside our schools. We have a responsibility to protect vulnerable youth from being misled. And so we have got to have a campaign that say, this will kill you, this is going to damage your health. Whatever has been coming out in the media so far really hasn't made a difference in changing the kids' attitudes. We're seeing a rise the last three years. I could go to any one of our eight high schools that are about 2,000 students each and ask a principal to open up a drawer and you will see thousands of vape cartridges. These numbers are probably underreported. These percentages are actually a lot lower than what actually is going on. They're probably lying about it because, you know, they don't want to get caught. They don't want their parents to find out. They're hiding it from people. But I also think that they know that it's bad. But they're addicted to this point where it's like, okay, I can't stop. I think our students are responding to the pressure cooker that we ourselves have inadvertently created. I mean, the competitive environment among these kids, my kids were pretty good students, and I had no idea just the pressure that they were under. Ultimately, you're trying to figure out what works. Yeah. You know, we're trying to kind of help the kids that already are addicted, but we're also trying to bring awareness to how serious this is. It is a twofold approach, you know what I mean? Preventative side on one side, but there, there has to be that consequence on the other, especially when they're using things that are in violation of the law. We're moving in a direction where we've actually developed modules now, and we're putting kids on a restorative path, meaning there's a diversion program. Instead of putting cameras in bathrooms to catch kids, they're actually building posters and education tools. I think the number one resource to assist us along this will be our students because they're going to want, uh, they want the relief as bad, if not more so. Everyone's doing it, and that's where it becomes a problem, is because everyone says, my friends are doing it, they're fine, they're here today, and they don't have any problems, yeah. so it's okay if I do it. When they survey youth around why they're you know, using e-cigarettes, and it comes back to, well, my friends are doing it. If there's a lot of peer interaction. Friends are critically important, and so peer is going to be the key to reversing it, and then that educational piece so that they really do understand the truth. Somehow or another, we have a collectively have to make sure that this gets on the radar of every superintendent in this country to make sure that we're dealing with this. There's a call for action for us all to work together, engaging youth influencers, educators, parents, and informing youth and engaging youth themselves. Don't let the conversation end today, okay? Take it forward and let's do something about it. Okay, use the weight and the gravity of your signature, your position, and who you are within your communities to truly take this conversation forward and make an impact. Hello, and welcome to the American Heart and Stroke Association of Nebraska Tobacco Free Schools Workshop. I am Jennifer Redmond, and I am the Executive Director of the American Heart Association of Nebraska. Thank you for taking time today to join us and hear how the AHA is taking action on vaping and tobacco use in schools. A special thank you to our workshop sponsors, J.E. Dunn Construction, MCL Construction, and Holland Basham Architects. We appreciate your support with this important conversation. Our goal here today is to provide you with the information and resources you need to reduce student tobacco use and how to support those who are already addicted. We are going to discuss trends in youth tobacco use, student experiences, supportive discipline strategies, and how the AHA can support school districts to adopt comprehensive tobacco-free policies. We know you may have questions throughout the workshop. Please type those in the chat box and we will be addressing those later on in the workshop. We're gonna jump right in with our very own expert today in this area, Jeff Willett. He is the American Heart Association's VP of Integrated E-Cigarette Strategies to discuss youth trends in tobacco. Hi, everybody. 
I'm Jeff Willett, a Vice President for Advocacy with the American Heart Association, and I'm going to talk to you today about trends and emerging threats in youth tobacco use. So first, it's important to recognize how much progress we've made in reducing youth cigarette smoking. If we go back to 1997, the peak of the Joe Camel era, one in four high school students smoked cigarettes. We worked hard for over two decades, and in 2020, only one in 20 high school students smoked cigarettes. You know, that's a tremendous public health achievement, going from one in four to one in 20. But unfortunately, recently we've seen a tremendous increase in youth tobacco use through the form of e-cigarettes. And in 2020, one in five high school students used e-cigarettes. You know, a primary reason why young people start using e-cigarettes and continue to use e-cigarettes is the presence of flavored e-liquids, youth appealing flavors that really dominate the marketplace. We know that the vast majority of young people who first try an e-cigarette try with a flavored product. And we know the vast majority of, of students and young people who continue to use e-cigarettes are using e-liquids. So removing these youth appealing flavored products from the market is critical to public health. When we think about kind of the recent history with e-cigarettes, we can better understand how we got to the point today. In 2013, the major tobacco companies introduced their versions of the electronic cigarette, and they did so in largely an unregulated environment. The FDA did not have authority at the time to regulate e-cigarettes, and many of our states and communities didn't regulate uh, the sale of e-cigarettes. In 2015, Juul was introduced, and Juul had a very sleek, sophisticated design. It looked like a USB drive. It could be used very discreetly. Juul was sold in a wide range of youth-appealing flavors, and those liquids, the Juul liquids, had very high nicotine content. And it was really in 2015 that we started to see a tremendous acceleration in youth e-cigarette use. In 2016, the FDA was granted the authority to regulate e-cigarettes, and it's taking them some time you know, to uh, regulate them in a way that really protects kids. Um, you know, we saw in 2019 the outbreak of Evoli, the serious lung injury that was associated with vaping. And I think Evoli and, you know, the, the concern around uh, the vaping-related lung injuries certainly contributed to uh, increased awareness of the potential harms of e-cigarettes, and I think also contributed to some reduction that we've seen in youth e-cigarette use. And then in 2020, a couple major policy changes occurred. Uh, first, the age to purchase tobacco products, including e-cigarettes, was increased to 21 at the federal level. And then the FDA acted to remove certain flavored e-liquids uh, from the market. So if uh, you had a product that sold e-liquids in a pod or a cartridge system, kind of a refillable uh, pod or cartridge, uh, those products could no longer uh, uh, contain the flavored youth appealing liquids. But if it was a disposable system, you know, one time use disposable system or a tank system that you poured liquid in, refilled it with, uh, you know, a, a liquid that you purchased, um, those were exempt from the federal regulation. So we continue to see uh, disposables and refillable systems uh, selling the flavored e-liquids. So the fight against big tobacco is constantly changing. You know, we focused on cigarettes, passed a lot of policies, laws, regulations that contributed to a significant reduction in youth cigarette use. We have to be vigilant with the regard to the new products that the tobacco industry is introducing, and we need to address the loopholes that big tobacco successfully identifies to continue selling their products and addicting uh, new generations. So today, you know, we're really concerned about flavored tobacco products. We're really concerned about menthol cigarettes. And we're really concerned about the youth appealing flavors that are available in disposable systems like 
puffbar, and refillable systems like Sorin. And again, the tobacco companies look for loopholes in any regulation. So just fairly recently, Puff Bar, which is a disposable e-cigarette, it looks almost identical to a jewel, but it is designed for one-time use. Puff Bar announced that it is now using synthetic nicotine. And so it believes that it should be exempt from some of the federal, state, and local laws regarding e-cigarettes and other tobacco products. We have to constantly be vigilant. We have to constantly monitor what the tobacco industry is doing. And we have to ensure that we have the policy protections in place, especially for young people who should not be using these products under any circumstances. So with uh, current trends or recent trends in youth tobacco use, you know, we have seen a reduction between 2019 and 2020 with regard to the overall use of tobacco products among high school and middle school students, reductions in the use of e-cigarettes among both high school and middle school students, and a reduction in the use of combustible products. But we're still at a point where far too many young people are using tobacco products. Again, one out of every five high school students is using e-cigarettes. So again, the reductions that we saw between 2019 and 2020 are likely the result of EVALI, the serious lung injury, uh, likely related to the increase in the age to purchase tobacco products, and likely related to the removal of some flavored uh, e-liquids from the marketplace. But again, uh, we have seen the tobacco companies work to respond to that situation. So just to summarize what we see with teens and vaping, e-cigarettes are the most commonly used tobacco product among youth. 3.6 million youth across the United States are using e-cigarettes. And fruit, mint, menthol are the top flavors that we see young people using in terms of vaping. So again, those youth appealing flavors, even though there has been some action to remove them from the market, youth are still primarily using those flavored liquids. And disposables, disposable e-cigarettes are emerging as a primary threat. We saw a 1,000% increase in the use of disposable e-cigarettes by high school students and a 500% increase in the use of disposable e-cigarettes by middle school students in the past year. So Puff Bar and similar systems, similar disposable systems are working to gain market share and we need to be vigilant to ensure that that does not happen. And it's not just e-cigarettes that are the problem. New forms of tobacco like Zin, which is an oral tobacco, a nicotine pouch, and Icos, which is a heated tobacco product, have been introduced in the United States. Zin is sold in a wide range of flavors. We're keeping our eye on these products, and we want to ensure that all tobacco products are regulated in a way that is protecting kids first and foremost. We're working at the federal, state, and local level to ensure that all tobacco products, cigarettes, e-cigarettes, and other forms of tobacco are not addicting the next generation. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Claire. Um, I'm 16. I'm a junior. Well, I started vaping when I was probably in eighth or ninth grade. Um, it started through sports, honestly, just people on my team. Like that was who I was with most of my time. I, I didn't like it at first. It hurt. I coughed. It was like, I was like, this is icky. I think we need to deal with mental health and the reason why people are using. Personally, for me, vaping was a way to have something else like use to cope with my mental health, to cope with my depression, to cope with my anxiety. I would go through three pods a day, which would be like my pods held, held about like two milliliters. And so two milliliters of juice, if you like look it up, is equivalent to 
like a pack of cigarettes worth of nicotine. And so technically I was inhaling three packs worth of nicotine. I got so scared, but I was too scared to tell anyone that this was happening to me because I knew I was going to get in trouble. I hated it. And yet the addiction was so strong that I kept using. And my parents, they did not have the reaction I thought. My mom was like, like she sat me down and I talked to my mom and my dad for like a solid like two hours. Life is not easy. Like school's not easy. Friendships are not easy. But you need to make it through this hard point in your life so that you can have your future. And addictive chemicals aren't going to help you get there. It's not going to get you to where you want to be. Thank you for inviting me to speak about our work in developing cessation interventions for youth e-cigarette use. My name is Suchitra Krishnan Saran. I'm a professor of psychiatry at Yale School of Medicine. I have no disclosures and the work I'm going to be talking about today is funded through the American Heart Association and Nicotine Addiction in Children and Teens Initiative and the NIDA and uh, uh, FDA funded Yale Tobacco Centers on Regulatory Science. So the goal of ENACT is to develop youth-focused e-cigarette cessation interventions. But in order to do this, you first need to understand why are adolescents or youth drawn to e-cigarettes? And a lot of my work to date has been on identifying these factors. One of the factors that we've identified as important is the nicotine concentration or nicotine content of e-cigarettes. All e-cigarettes contain nicotine and use of nicotine leads to nicotine addiction. In fact, nicotine is one of the main addictive ingredients in tobacco products, and it binds to a receptor called the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which is present on almost every organ of the human body. So if you use nicotine, you are producing changes in almost every organ, as shown on the, in the left-hand side uh, figure. Among youth, we worry a lot more about nicotine use because the adolescent brain is known to be more sensitive to nicotine than the adult brain. Moreover, Youth who are exposed to tobacco and nicotine are primed for nicotine addiction and also addiction to other substances. Nicotine also alters developmental maturing of the adolescent brain, and it can produce changes in learning, memory, attention processes, and induce hyperactivity. So as you can see, we worry about nicotine use amongst youth because there are multiple effects that nicotine has on youth, and youth are using a lot of nicotine-containing products. In fact, some of the e-cigarettes like Juul have what is called a nicotine salt. Now, just to give you a little chemistry lesson, most tobacco products like combustible cigarettes contain freebase nicotine, which is a lot more irritating to the, in the throat when you first use it. Which, this is why a lot of youth choose not to use cigarettes because they don't like the irritating effects of nicotine in their throat. But many e-cigarettes like Juul contain a nicotine salt, which is produced by combining nicotine with, in this case, benzoic acid to produce nicotine benzoate. These salts are a lot easier to use, they are less harsh, and therefore the fear is that youth will use a lot more nicotine and be more nicotine addicted. Youth are also using e-cigarettes for many alternative purposes that are highlighted on this slide. They use them to do vape tricks. Um, and in our uh, Connecticut data in 2017, almost 36% of youth said they had tried vape tricks which involves producing vape clouds of different shapes and sizes as the figure shows. They also use it for a behavior called dripping, which involves dripping the e-liquid directly onto the open battery and inhaling the vapors. And they also use it for vaping cannabis. So any intervention directed towards youth needs to address all the issues I just mentioned. Use of multiple devices, use of nicotine, uh, use and adaptation of e-cigarettes for alternative behaviors, use for marijuana vaping, and use for flavors, which I did not cover, but I know an earlier talk did. The next thing you need to do, know before you develop a cessation program is what do youth want in a cessation program? After all, you want this to be a program that they like and that they will use. So we conducted focus groups with uh, youth e-cigarette users in Connecticut high schools and asked them this exact question. One of our main findings from these focus groups was that most youth want to quit. As the comments highlight, uh, it indicates that almost everyone tries to quit and struggles with it, and nobody wants to be participating in these behaviors, but they just don't know how to quit. 
we asked them about some reasons for quitting. And some reasons they identified were health concerns, addiction, and the influence of vaping on their physical performance. Some comments included, I would vape and, uh, vape and wake up in the middle of the night coughing for 10 minutes straight. Or during sports, it would make my breathing worse. So right before the sport session started, I would stop using the product. So youth are very aware of what these products are doing to their health. They also identified a lot of barriers to quitting, including addiction. Many of them said they were addicted, they didn't like using it, but they really fiended for it. Many identified friends, um, they said that almost one person in every friend group had a nicotine device, so it was hard to avoid it. Stress was identified as a huge barrier to quitting because they said that was e-cigarettes were the only product that helped them stop thinking about all the stuff that was going on in their head, so it was like a stress reliever. And then overcoming school. Uh, they saw so many cues related to e-cigarette use at school that they said that was a really hard thing to overcome when they were at school. We asked them about the desired characteristics of a quit vaping program and some things they identified were the freedom to choose to quit. This was very important to them. Um, they did not like the idea of mandatory quitting or suspension, but really wanted to be educated so they could make the choice to quit. Confidentiality was important to them because they said it was embarrassing to admit, to admit that they were addicted to something and use of counselors from outside the school because they did not, they felt that if uh, the counselor was from the school, then there would be further actions taken through the school. Some other common themes for content that came up included addressing education and educating them about the health effects of vaping. They really wanted to know what was in the product and if it was going to have any bad health effects on them and they felt that would make them stop immediately. They uh, were interested in the inclusion of personal anecdotes and experiences. Um, for example, pictures of people who were affected by uh, vaping and what health effects they had had. And they felt that that would really make a difference in terms of what they would, um, um, their use behaviors. And lastly, uh, the use of rewards or incentives to really motivate youth uh, and um, make sure that they were motivated to quit. So uh, with all this information, we uh, are moving forward and uh, working with both American Heart Association and the ENAC program to develop interventions in schools and out of school locations. And uh, we welcome uh, input from our school partners and from American Heart Association in this work as we move forward. Hi, my name is Jeremy Lyon. I'm a former school superintendent, uh, 31 years in public education. Um, my most recent um, assignment was to serve as interim superintendent with Carroll ISD here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, um, a high-performing suburban uh, school district. Um, I served three months as an interim um, in part because I really wanted to see what was going on with the not only the in-school versus virtual environment, but also what's going on with the, the vaping uh, thing that um, uh, was happening at an epidemic uh, proportion a year ago, and then uh, COVID hit. Um, in fall of 2019, I was uh, able to host a National Superintendent's Roundtable with the American Heart Association on the issue of vaping. And at that time, we were freely using the, the term epidemic because it was an epidemic. And um, uh, school bathrooms uh, at middle schools and high schools had turned into uh, vaping lounges and all of the devices that uh, we are all aware of. Um, so we did have an epidemic at that time and we didn't have a lot of answers yet regarding the response by school districts. Um, most of them fell into the category of punitive consequences within existing disciplinary codes. And there was widespread agreement at the National Forum that um, we need that, but we also need to pivot to have some tools in our toolbox to talk about cessation programs, restorative practices, and how do we help kids uh, get off of nicotine addiction through vaping. So then the COVID pandemic hit, schools closed and miraculously the vaping issue vaporized. It just went away. Um, but the question is, did it just go away? 
And that's kind of where we are now exploring in the context of working on recovery plans for the 2021-22 school year, particularly, what is uh, the piece that's necessary for addressing properly vaping as kids come back to school? As schools kind of put together the pieces this spring and for next year, um, I think there's some things that we have to look at. Let me give you an example. Uh, a suburban large district here in Texas, last month's board meeting, um, the board approved a $327,000 expenditure to equip every middle school and high school with vaping detection devices. And so they, part of their recovery plan is when kids come back, all the restrooms and I think common areas are gonna have these vaping detection devices at a considerable cost, $327,000. The question for this district is, where's the other half of that equation? Where is the intervention part? Because I guess the analogy that I think of is, you know, it's like termites in the home, right? If, if you have great termite detection, um, yet you never address the root cause of where the termites live, where, where that epicenter of where they're coming from is, you can detect all day, but you're not really doing anything to ultimately eradicate and reduce the problem. So in the, in the case of this district that has spent $327,000 on vaping detection, great, good for them, but I'm assuming that there's a strong recovery piece in place that goes down the road of talking about policy, uh, revamping policies to help students uh, get off of the nicotine addiction, addiction to um, provide pathways and really not just for students, but maybe for staff as well to beat the nicotine addiction. Um, so we're in an interesting place because we really don't know what's gonna happen uh, come this next year. If you're in a school district, much like most of the districts in Texas, the bathroom situation in schools is gonna change completely because they're not going to be vaping lounges anymore because currently you've got new technologies in place and you've got new protocols in place where only two students at a time go into those restrooms. Will that continue next year? I don't know. That's a district by district decision, but it's not a great use of resources either to have a recovery plan next year where you're gonna put monitors outside of every restroom in your schools as was frequently the case this past year, pre-COVID pandemic, uh, when we were just trying to scramble and address the vaping issues. You know, we gotta help kids. We've got to, we've got to provide this blueprint for a pathway forward that includes really, really good policy reviews, policy revisions, and pathways to help students as opposed to just punishing them. Every school district is putting together their recovery plan. And school boards are keen to see elements of that plan that really resonate. Addressing vaping issues and the tobacco issues related to policy for this next school year will really be a natural and a welcomed piece of your recovery plan for school boards. And that's important because school boards are basically the conduits to the community who are cheerleading your efforts to return to normal. A good comprehensive vaping element within that recovery plan is going to be really well received and fits the whole public health policy response. It fits the new status that school nurses and health professionals are going to have apparently from this point forward. We know they've always been champions, but now everybody knows it and everybody understands their importance. So this is important work. I was uh, very invested in children's health and wellness during my career as a superintendent and still am. Believe very, very strongly in the American Heart Association and the tools and resources that they have. Um, it's been a tough year for AHA in regards to all of their normal access and support by schools kind of went by the wayside and rightfully so. But as we come back, as we kind of redefine what public education and private education looks like 
as we move forward, this is the perfect time to really uh, look at policies and look at this whole vaping issue. What have we learned? Where are we going? And how can we help students kick the habit of vaping so that it just is not an issue anymore? I wish you the best. Thank you so much for all the work that you do. What a year and um, it's, it, the, the future is bright. Thank you so much. I'm Will. I'm a senior in high school right now, 17. I was 14 when I started vaping. I had smoked cigarettes before for a while. So when they were like, hey, it's the same thing. It's just safer. It's fine. It's like water vapor. There's less nicotine. None of those things are true. Um, so I tried it. And the first thing you notice is how much smoother it feels. It doesn't feel as dangerous as a cigarette does. I think it's often overlooked how much a uh, part mental health plays in addiction. I'm diagnosed with depression and anxiety, and it's been a really difficult thing in my life. So when I was introduced to nicotine, it was like, hey, it's this chemical that makes you feel better. When I first started, I was a cross-country runner and cross-country skier, but um, my lung capacity was never the same. It felt like I was getting out of shape, but I knew I wasn't. Okay. And what a great story Will has, a uh, real life, life story on the stress of, of kids these days. Um, hello, I'm Corey Erdkamp, longtime volunteer for the American Heart Association, and I'm privileged to serve on the executive leadership team this year. I've worked for Jay Dunn for 23 years now, and I'm happy that Jay Dunn has sponsored this webinar. As a parent, if you think your child is not currently aware of tobacco and vaping products in 2021, then you are simply not in touch with reality like Will is. Social media is helping to educate our youth into making bad decisions that are not healthy life choices. I would encourage you to have regular conversations with your kids about the dangers involved with using tobacco products. I would also encourage you to look at your kid's phone. Snapchat and other apps allow kids to hide things from their parents. We as parents are the ones that need to get to go out of our way to help our kids. Thank you, Corey, for sharing. Uh, much appreciated. As a reminder, if you do have questions, please type those in the chat box and we will be addressing those in a little bit here. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Ryan Lally. I am the Community Impact Director at the American Heart Association in Nebraska. I am also your contact for support around tobacco-free school policies and for resources and information. Um, my email is at the end of the slideshow here. Um, it is ryan.lally at heart.org. If you have to jump off early, um, it'll also be available in the chat box at your convenience here. Um, I'd also be happy to have any conversations with you um, or anyone uh, of your colleagues that you think would be appropriate to further this discussion. Today, I'm gonna to cover each of the components of a comprehensive tobacco-free policy, including education, policy and environment, and a supportive approach for students. We'll also discuss what the AHA can do to support your school district with implementation. You are all so important to this work. Teachers and schools are always one of the greatest assets as a society, and the pandemic made that all the more clear. Schools are the front lines of the youth vaping epidemic. Faculty and staff are uniquely positioned to identify and support students who may be addicted to nicotine or at risk of addiction. Specifically, schools can structure their education and disciplinary practices to help prevent youth from starting and offer supportive approaches when students are caught using tobacco products. The goal is to one, educate students about tobacco products and the dangers of nicotine. Two, help students remain fully engaged in their education if they are already addicted. And three, pass comprehensive policy that supports a 100% tobacco-free environment. So let's dig in a little bit more. When we talk about education around tobacco and nicotine addiction, it's similar to any other knowledge we are hoping to pass on to students. It needs to be consistent and relevant. 
we suggest that students are interacting with the curriculum at least once a year and that the curriculum aligns with state standards. Age appropriate and culturally relevant material is important. Not one size fits all. Prevention is most effective if students can relate and see themselves and their experiences in the content. It's also important to remember that there are different meanings and attitudes around tobacco in different communities that should be considered. We've also found the information is better retained if it's delivered in a variety of ways, through classroom instruction, written materials, discussions, school-wide activities, et cetera. Consider student-to-student -student and parent education strategies. The staff responsible for teaching tobacco education should also be provided with continuous professional learning opportunities to learn how to, effect to effectively deliver the program. This effort doesn't end with students. Tobacco education should include everyone that is interacting in the school environment, from the students, staff, parents, and the visitors. The American Heart Association has a range of resources for different audiences to help communicate accurate information about tobacco and vaping and offer strategies to help any tobacco users quit for good. We know students are not the only ones using tobacco. To help staff walk the walk, tobacco education and, and cessation services should be offered for staff. This is about keeping everyone healthy, and that includes the adults. Final point on the education. Be careful not to accept curriculum developed or funded by the tobacco industry, because it's out there. The youth are crucial to the tobacco industry. They need replacement smokers. When implementing a policy, it's important that all products are covered. This is the obvious products like cigarettes, chewing tobacco, cigars, et cetera. This also includes e-cigarettes, lighters, rolling papers, and any electronic smoking device, whether or not it contains nicotine. Many schools have tobacco-free policies, but we want to assist in strengthening those to make sure all products are captured. As you heard from Jeff, e-cigarettes are the products most appealing to youth contributing to the increase in use. What else is in a strong tobacco-free policy? Well, it pertains to any person on school grounds, including staff and visitors. It also prohibits the possession by students. It applies at all times, before, during, and after school hours, weekends, field trips, and in vehicles on the school property. And last, the policy would provide a progressive, supportive approach to discipline when students are in violation of the policy. In talking about tobacco policy, it's important to have a supportive disciplinary approach. In schools relying on traditional discipline, the biggest issue is that a student broke a rule. In a school using supportive discipline, the biggest issue is tobacco use and bringing it to school impacts their health and has the potential to create harm for other students as well. Include supportive strategies such as parental and caregiver notification, collaborative conversations between the student and a staff member, offering information to the student about available tobacco education cessation, and facilitating enrollment in the student if the student is interested. Disciplinary meetings between the student, a parent or caregiver, and designated staff, and enrollment and alternatives to suspension programs. What it should not include is suspension and expulsion unless they are a very last resort. Do not take away extracurriculars or impose fines. We want students to stay engaged with their education and fines can be prohibitive for families and create hardships. Do not involve school resource officers or law enforcement in disciplinary procedures. Why do we suggest avoiding suspension? The goal is to support students in their education and in, re and in reality, Suspension leads to disengagement and lower academic performance overall. That can continue into post-secondary education. Supportive strategies make the student and school staff collaborate in a disciplinary response. A supportive approach can have the triple benefit of supporting student academic achievement, improving health, and decreasing inequities. So now you're on board and ready to pass a policy. Here are some things to keep in mind. Any change in policy is more successful when the people impacted by it are engaged and are part of the process. Get buy-in and educate early. Educate, include information about the policy change in newsletters and letters to parents and caregivers. 
and consistently enforce the policy. Everyone in, is in this together and the trusted adults can be lead by example. Review the policy periodically. We've already seen how, this, how the change in the way people consume tobacco has changed how we need to respond to it. E-cigarettes won't be the last new thing in tobacco consumption. How can the American Heart Association support school districts? Well, number one, I, I can be a great resource for you. I'm a, I'm a resource. I can assist with conversations, organizing, share or personalized materials, et cetera. We have education resources for students, staff, parents, and caregivers. Examples of signage and materials to communicate policy changes are also available. And school districts that adopt a policy may be eligible for a stipend to support costs. So please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions or need any, information, need any more information. Um, and this is all kind of I have from my end today. Uh, I'd like to open it up for any questions or comments. Uh, please uh, type those in the chat box and we'll, we do our best to answer. So I'm gonna open it up to, to Jeff and myself if there's any questions. I think um, I looked on here, I know we had a couple here. We were doing a, a Facebook Live as well. So here's a question. Uh, Jeff might be good, one that you've seen across the board. Uh, what is the some of the craziest ways you've heard of companies hiding and disguising vaping devices that youth are using? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there's a whole category of stealth vaping devices. If you just Google stealth vaping, uh, you'll see all kinds of things. I mean, I've, I've seen, you know, uh, little uh, containers that are supposed to look like uh, TikTok packages that are vape devices. They're the hoodies that have, you know, the, the drawstring uh, of the hoodie is actually uh, something you can use for vaping. I mean, it's, it's almost an infinite array of, of gizmos and gadgets and, and crazy, crazy stuff that's really supporting uh, that whole vape trick uh, concept that uh, Sue Chitra was talking about. You know, I think it speaks to how ingrained vaping has, uh, has become in, in youth culture today. Uh, the whole stealth vaping uh, gizmo category just, uh, you know, shows, uh, you know, shows how the industry is trying to ensure that these products can be used anywhere and everywhere and that it's kind of a daring, risky, cool thing to do. Definitely, thank you for that, Jeff, and the resource. Uh, there's definitely a, uh, a lot of ways that kids are, kids are doing this and, and the way the tobacco companies are targeting kids. So um, appreciate that. Uh, another question that we had come across here is, uh, what are the, some of the first steps that you should do if you suspect a student or even your child is vaping? You know, I would say if you're if it's your child, you should have a conversation with them. Certainly, uh, you know, as Corey suggested, we should be talking to our children right now, even if we don't suspect that they're uh, they're vaping. Um, so just having that conversation, you know, in Claire's video, she she made it clear that she wanted to quit, but she was afraid to reach out. She was afraid to talk to her parents initially. Uh, so I think what we need to do is appreciate that an unregulated industry has targeted young people, targeted young people with, you know, a nicotine delivery device, a, a drug delivery device that's sold in a wide range of youth appealing flavors. So our kids have been targeted by the industry. Uh, many of them are using, you know, one in five at least are using, uh, many are on the path to addiction. And from our uh, surveillance surveys, uh, we know that almost half of all uh, young people who vape want to quit. So uh, if your child is vaping, there's a good likelihood that they want to quit and probably would appreciate that, uh, that conversation. And I think the same, you know, the same is true for students. Um, ensuring that we're just making students aware of the cessation resources that are available. There's a wonderful text-based program that the Truth Initiative has developed. Um, you know, just ensuring that your school has posters and flyers, uh, letting young people know about that program and and other programs, so that they can reach out for help when they, you know, when they want to. Definitely. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, hey, Ryan, I see a... Go ahead, go ahead. 
Uh, I see some questions in the chat here. Um, you know, a really important question is, is there a form of tobacco that is less harmful? That's a wonderful question. Uh, so uh, undoubtedly, cigarettes are the most dangerous uh, tobacco product. They're the tobacco product that causes the most death and disease. Uh, and in a side-by-side -side comparison, uh, an e-cigarette is likely going to be less harmful. Uh, however, we don't know exactly what the long-term consequences of e-cigarette use are. And as we saw with Evali, you know, the use of, of vaping can cause almost immediate and severe lung injury, which we don't see with cigarettes. But another way to look at it is, you know, from a health, uh, from a public health standpoint or a health standpoint, we know that both are bad. And we know that nicotine is bad for, for kids. We know that nicotine is bad for, for every young person and they should not be using those products. And also from a public health standpoint, you know, we in public health, uh, when someone is, is jumping uh, out of a window, we don't uh, encourage them to go you know, to the a lower floor and jump out of a, a lower floor. We say, don't jump out of the window. We go upstream and we try to end the threat. And so uh, you know, e-cigarettes may be relatively safer uh, side by side, but we have millions of young people today who are vaping who would have never picked up a tobacco product if it weren't for e-cigarettes and the marketing related to them. Definitely a great question. Um, we've got one last little uh, thought and comment and maybe the question to follow up. I've seen a couple of good comments here about um, loving to hear the supportive approach. Um, as a parent, how uh, can we support and be an advocate within our schools to adopt policies around the, the supportive approach versus the, the disciplinary approach? You know, I think just have that conversation with your principal, with, uh, you know, with your superintendent. Uh, at the beginning of my son's uh, freshman year in high school, the high school sent out a weekly parent newsletter. And uh, for the first several weeks of the school year, the first line in the newsletter was, to date, the Andover Central High School has called 911 for, uh, for vaping related violations X number of times, you know, and, and X increased as every week went by. Uh, and so a number of us parents were concerned, you know, uh, what's going on? Uh, we reached out and talked to the principal and they were one of those school districts where their first response was to bring in law enforcement. They were sick of this. They didn't want to see it in the school and they were dropping the hammer. Uh, well, through conversations with that school, uh, with the school district, they implemented a more peer-to-peer -peer based supportive program. You know, they still include the, you know, some punitive discipline uh, for multiple violations, but primarily now they're focused on, you know, identifying uh, young people who vape uh, and giving them uh, kind of a supportive path uh, rather than calling law enforcement. So, you know, the principals, the superintendent, they'd love to hear from you on any number of topics, uh, I'm sure. And so for this one, uh, I think you should certainly reach out and have that conversation just to see what their policy is and, and what steps they're taking. Perfect. Thank you. Um, what programs does the AHA have for support for our school districts? Well, Ryan, you did a wonderful job outlining the support that we have. I think, you know, for uh, Nebraska schools, Ryan Lally is, uh, is the support that we have. Uh, you know, we've got a toolkit that identifies a number of uh, evidence-informed prevention programs and cessation programs alternatives to suspension. And, you know, Ryan is your best point of contact for figuring out, you know, what the right approach might be for your, uh, for your school district. Uh, Sue Chitra, who presented, is one of our funded researchers. The American Heart Association invested $17 million to uh, study the impact that nicotine has on young people and to identify more effective uh, programs to help young people quit. So Suchitra's team, they're, they're right now, they're uh, studying a, a new cessation program among uh, high school students in Connecticut. And we have other 
research teams that are studying other programs. So as that research uh, kind of matures, as we learn more, as we develop you know, our own programs, uh, we will definitely share those with you as well. Uh, but you know, have no doubt that we're, we're working uh, as quickly as we can to identify the most effective interventions to help young people quit. Definitely, and thank you for that, Jeff. And I look forward to, to working with any school district that would like to look at their policies and, and see how we can refine those and, and really um, take this approach. So um, definitely would love to do that. Um, I'm gonna round it out here. Yes, Laura, uh, my email is ryan.lally, L-A-L-L-Y at heart.org. And it'll be on the last slide here too, as we get at the end. And uh, with that, I'll kind of close it out and I'll turn it over to Jennifer Redmond. Thank you, Jeff, for your comments, for your, uh, your advice and for your expertise here. Um, and definitely we look forward to continuing the conversation face-to-face uh, -face, uh, or over uh, virtual meetings uh, moving forward through, uh, throughout the year here. So I'll uh, turn it over to Jen for, uh, to close it out here. Absolutely, thank you. You know what, thank you everyone for taking the time to join us in this very important conversation. We appreciate the speakers as well as the attendees. We cannot make a difference in the schools and in our students' lives without all of you. I hope this wor workshop serves as a start to the conversation for you, your school district, your students, and your family. We are available to work with your school district administrators support to support this important cause. And our contact info is on the slide. So we, we certainly hope to hear from you. You know what, thank you again for your attention to this extremely important issue. We hope to continue to work with our community and each of you to reduce and even eliminate tobacco use in our community. Thank you for joining us today.